Let's all stand and turn to 307. 307. Jesus loves me. is characterized by love, but uh, I just want to tell you, it was great to have Bible school. You know, we had, I think, I think they said 70 people, I guess, preacher can give the official count after a while, but good number. And Mackie and Dylan, you did a great job. And all the volunteers, Coley and Ronald, you always do good. <laughs> but everybody, all the volunteers, you did a great job. And uh, is great. But um, any prayer, prayer requests before we get started? Thank you, Dean. Characterized by love. So the question today is what do you love? You know, I got to thinking about what I love. I love my wife. I love my family. And I especially love my granddaughter. <laughs> I love that I'm retired from the EMS. Don't have to go back down there and work anymore. I love trying to be an orchardist, growing apples and peaches. I haven't perfected it like Armit has. I love my church. You know, I love being able to come back to church after COVID. You know, for my birthday, Seth, he bought me a 65-inch TV. So I love watching my big TV now. I love our country. You know, I uh, saw uh, the governor from South Dakota this morning say that 
When you woke up this morning, you were better off than 99% of the people in the world just because you woke up in this country. I love our country, and I thank God that I live in this country, even though it has been turning its back on God for years and years, and it is declining pretty quickly right now. You know, I could go on and on. I could go on and on about things that I love. And the thing is, each one of us could make a big list on things that we love. The fact is, God, he has blessed me. And he's blessed each one of us. Loving and enjoying things, it's a great thing. The problem, though, is loving certain things so much that our focus shifts to these things instead of the one, the one that we should be serving. You know, we can be doing all the right things. Being a faithful church member, being kind and being respectful, a respectful person in our society. But then our love can sometimes take a back seat to other things that we love. In Matthew chapter 22, uh, verse 37, Jesus, what happened, he was asked by a Pharisee lawyer, what was the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the point of our lesson is that we should Do all things in the love of Christ. Everything everything that we do should include God. Our lesson is taken from Revelations. And before we get started reading it, let's do just a little bit of background. After uh, Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus commanded his disciples to go throughout the world and preach the gospel. John was one of them, and we have uh, in God's word five books in the New Testament that John recorded, with one of them being Revelations. You know, God, or, or not God, John, he had spent a lot of time in the city of Ephesus. It was one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire back then, and it had a robust economy due to being located on the uh, uh, western shore of Asia Minor, and it had a very busy harbor. Had a population of around 250,000 people, so it was a busy place back then. But one of the things it was known for was its temple. The temple to the goddess of Artemis. The temple, it was known to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Now the church there with with John and stuff, the church of Ephesus, it was a good church. Good church. You know, they were known for their works. But some of the people there in the city, they didn't like John preaching. Didn't like him preaching the gospel. Because it was taking people away from the temple of the goddess of Artemis. Some people, especially the silversmiths, the silversmiths, they made shrines to Artemis. And with John's preaching the gospel and people turning to Jesus, it was what it was doing, it was hurting their prophets. So to make a long story short, John ended up being exiled. 
exiled from Ephesus to the to now was it was on the island of Pat, Patmos, which was just off the coast of Asia Minor. And this is when he recorded Revelation. John, what happened? He witnessed. He witnessed a vision from Jesus and was commanded to write down what he was about to hear and what he was about to see. Then John was to send these letters to the seven churches in seven different cities, with one of them being Ephesus. Now, a lot of these churches, they were, they were, a lot of them were facing persecution. So each church had a specific message of com uh, commendation, but also of warning. So now to our lesson, we'll get to number uh, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Jesus addressed his letter to the angel of the church of Ephesus. There are some different opinions on who the angel is. But I believe, and I, I think this is right, I believe uh, the angel was the pastor of the church. Angel in this context means messenger. The pastor was designated to deliver this message to his congregation. Jesus probably didn't name the pastor by name because it would identify him and he may have faced prosecution or persecution. Jesus, he identifies himself as the one that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand and who walked in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Jesus, he was the leader of these churches. So Jesus, what he does, he starts praising, starts praising the church of Ephesus here. So we'll read verse 2 and 3. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and thou hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, has not fainted. You know, Jesus, he was telling them that he knew everything, everything they had been doing. Their works. It refers to how they were living their daily lives uh, in the church and also out of the church. Their labor, which refers to how hard they, is, they were working to minister to people and tell people about Jesus. And then their patience. You know, they were steadfast. And it didn't matter what type of suffering they were uh, about to face or be facing or what they might lose. They stood strong for the gospel of Christ. Good church. Jesus was commanding them because they were doing good. Then Jesus praised them more. Says they can't not bear them which are evil. You know, there was some self-proclaimed apostles that were teaching false doctrine. And what they were doing, they were trying to disrupt the church. These so-called apostles were attempting to get the church to turn back to pagan religions that was already all over the city. But the church, it stood strong. The church, what they did, they examined these apostles and found them out to be liars. You know, there's always, always been false prophets, and we still have them today. They do, they do their best to deceive Christians away from the truth and try to get them to follow them, like the Jehovah Witnesses. These cults, they twist. They twist God's word around, and even they add scripture so they'll try to fit into their teaching. We as Christians and we as a church, 
We need to be aware and examine what we hear. If it doesn't follow God's word, then we need to turn from it. In verse 3, Jesus, he continued to commend them. You know, the city of Ephesus was, it was, like I said, it was the center, one of the centers of paganism. The church, it probably faced all kinds of violence. And it was probably hurt economically. But the church, it stood strong. Every challenge, every challenge they faced, they stayed faithful to Jesus. So by reading these first three verses, the church, it was a great church. A church that you'd be proud to be able to say, I go to that church. But in verse 4, there's a negative turn. It says, Nevertheless, I have found somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Have you ever been praised by your boss? Or maybe when you was growing up, your parents, they said, man, you are doing a great job, but you don't want to hear that word, but. Well, in this verse, the church was doing a great job. Nevertheless, they didn't want to hear that word, nevertheless. Now, studying this lesson, these verses started stepping on my toes. In fact, it may step on all of our toes a little bit. The Ephesian church had done good. And they're, you know, with their works, and they maintain doctrine purity. But they had left their first love. So what was Jesus talking about here? Had they lost their love for each other? Had they lost their heartfelt love for Jesus? Were they just going through the motions worshiping Jesus? The answer is probably all the above. Their actions were good, but their motives was questionable. The church, it was probably getting along good. They worked together to accomplish the mission of Christ. But their love for each other, it wasn't like it used to be. Maybe they, they, maybe they uh, wasn't putting each other f uh, first and putting themselves last. It was, maybe it was more about getting God's work done and their love for each other, it was declining. Their love had grown, was growing cold toward each other and their love for Christ was growing cold. What, what they were lacking, this great church, what they were lacking was the most important thing, love. Remember what Jesus said was the most important commandment that we just read. It's love. In verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So Jesus says the first thing to do is to remember. Now, each one of us can do this. Remember, just think about it. Remember back when you were saved. Just think about it. Remember how you felt. All the weight was taken off our shoulders. But something more important. Remember the love that you felt. You loved everything. You loved everyone when you were saved. You was filled with love. So Jesus says to remember and return back to that love. Now here is my problem. 
This is where I got my toes stepped on good. There are some people that I have a hard time loving. You know, I know someone that destroyed their marriage, treated their children and spouse in the most awful way. I have a hard time loving that person. Our government officials, some of them, I have a hard time in my heart to love them, especially when I think of them as evil <laughs> and doing things I do not agree with. This is hard. This is hard for me to love them. So what does Jesus say? He commands us to repent. Told you it stepped on my toes. Repentance, it will change our attitude. You know, someone that is not saved, Jesus commands them to repent of their sins and turn to Jesus for salvation. But we that are saved, we sometimes must admit of our sins and repent and return back to the right relationship to God. Jesus says if they didn't, there if they didn't repent, that he would remove thy candlestick out of his place. This means the Ephesian church will, le will lose their usefulness to Christ if they, if they didn't turn back to their first love. You know, there are many churches, many, many churches have lost their first love for Christ. They go through the motions of worship. Go home, live their lives, live what they love to love, such as their car, maybe money, maybe their job, just naming a few things. They must repent and go back to the way they were when they were saved and be motivated by that gratitude and love for Jesus. But for me, here in verse 6 was some good news for me. It says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolodians, which I also hate. Say, so how did that help you? The Ephesians, they maybe they lost their love for God like they once had. But Jesus was pleased with their hatred of the false teachers' or deeds. Jesus, he didn't say he hated the, false, the uh, false teachers. Did not say that. He hated their deeds. Jesus, he loves everyone, but hates the sin they commit. So when I struggle to love certain people, I need to break it down in a couple of parts. The person that divorced and treated their kids and spouse so bad, I should hate that person's sin. The politicians that I believe are evil and do nothing much that I agree with, I don't have to like their character I don't have to like their immoral deeds or the way they govern. In fact, I can and I should hate abortion and other sins that they may support. But for the person, I should love them. I should pray. I should pray for them and pray that they may accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Because here's another fact. This is the only way that person will truly change. This is not an option for us. We're commanded to love. And when we have, when, when we have God's love in our heart, 
it will become more natural for us to love and show God's love to others. Our last verse here is uh, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You know, when Jesus was teaching, he taught a lot, a lot by using parables. Jesus, he did not expect everyone that heard him to understand what he was saying. Only those that had an open heart and an open mind would understand the truths that Jesus was saying. Those people that had a hard, hardened heart, they would hear the parables and they may say, Boy, Jesus, he tells a good story. But they would still remain blind to God's word concerning the kingdom and salvation. Many people today, they have hardened hearts. They may hear the gospel, but they won't listen to it. They may hear the Spirit urging them, but they won't listen to the Spirit. But it doesn't mean that we should stop telling them about Jesus. We should pray, pray, that their hardened hearts and minds will be open to the truth of the gospel. All seven churches, or all seven letters to the seven churches, they closed with a promise to each church. In this letter, the promise was to him that overcometh. Those that stood strong on God's word no matter what type of hardship any of us may face, maybe even potentially even persecution, we, we that overcometh, would have the right to eat of the tree of life. The tree of life was one of the trees that was in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they could eat and enjoy this fruit until they ate from the tree of knowledge, which they were forbidden to eat from. They disobeyed God. And now now they were prevented from eating the fruit from the tree of life and had to leave the garden. But through Jesus, he restored access to the tree of of life located in the paradise of God. All those who put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, eternal life has been restored to live with him forever. Amen. To sum this lesson up, make sure that we put Christ first in everything. Everything we do Make sure we involve Jesus. If anybody has ever lost their first love, repent and return back. That's the lesson. Anyway, I hope everybody got something from that. And uh, well, thank everybody. For-